विश्वाय चक्षुरमृत तस्म श्रीगुरव नम I'm grateful to be here. Am I audible behind? Is this working? Okay, I can speak a little loudly otherwise. Okay. So. That's uh, okay. It's much better now, isn't it? So I'm grateful to be here amongst all of you today. Moksha Yoga. Thank, thank Darren for helping us, for inviting us here. And so I will be speaking on the topic of karma reincarnation and what they mean for us, how to demystify them. <coughs> I'll start with uh, some personal experiences of this topic, which I had at different times. Then I'll talk about. how i was introduced to my spiritual journey through some interesting scientific evidence and then i'll talk a little bit about how i've experienced a few more of the insights of the yoga tradition while sharing this in different parts of the world so as some of you may noticed i use crutches for walking so it, when i was a, just about 1 year old i was just like a normal boy walking and one day i was walking i just collapsed my parents were alarmed they took me to doctor and they found that i had got polio and polio is a disease which can be avoided by vaccination and my parents had actually given me the vaccination but somehow the doctor who had been in charge i was living in a small place in india the doctor was in charge of the clinic over there he had not kept the vaccine very well so the vaccine was damaged and so the vaccine ended up giving me the polio instead of protecting me from the polio it became the cause of the polio so as i grew up you know i started thinking you know, what was it that caused this that was it my parents they could have gone to some other doctor he chose to go to this particular doctor was his doctors that he was careless and because of which this happened then i because i was not physically very active so i started reading a lot of books i became intellectually quite active and then my some of my relatives would come to my parents and they would talk and they would say that you know his physical so i was just a small child who was listening what they were saying so they would say that you know oh, the divine has compensated for his physical inability with intellectual ability so this was okay i was just hearing this trying to process this what what was all this about so for all of us in our life we see that there are certain events which lead to certain consequences so a leads to b our whole of life is based on a presumption that there is a cause effect connection in the world a couple of years ago when i was invited to cambridge to give a talk on science and spirituality i passed by the tree where newton is said to have seen the fruit falling at bridge the place where he saw that and there when he saw the fruit falling imagine if instead of newton a monkey had been sitting there what would the monkey have done eaten yeah just grab the fruit eat it and gone now instead of newton many other humans might also have done the same thing does newton ask the question what made this fruit fall and it was his brilliance that he came up with the theory of gravity based on such a simple observation and yet his question itself implies a presumption when he says asked what made this fruit fall there's a there's a presumption that things don't happen by chance that there is some order in the universe and we try to understand what that order is 
In fact, science itself would not be possible without this foundational assumption that nature works according to some order. Even the greatest of atheists, they accept as an article of faith that nature works according to some order. And they accept that this order is intrinsic in nature. Where does this order come from? That is a question that science, especially when we consider material science, often just avoids that question. There's no answer. This order has to be there and we try to discern the order. Now this is not just in science, it is also in our day to day life. If say you are staying with a friend and your friend comes home with a scar on their hand, the first thing you will ask, what happened? What happened means, what caused the scar? So when something unusual has happened, then we ask, what is the cause? If uh, one morning a, a person calls their physician, tells, I got a stomach upset. The first thing the physician will ask is, what do you think the physician will ask? What did you eat last night? What did you eat? So, uh, when, there's a, so when there's an effect, we assume there must be a cause. And the cause-effect connection is the basis of our functioning in life. If there were no cause-effect connection or if we cannot figure out a cause-effect connection, things can become very bewildering. So if you hear the door opening behind and you look and there's nobody at the door, what happened? Is somebody got a remote by which they're opening the door? We, we make sense of the world in terms of finding causes for effects or understanding this cause effect correlation. And this cause effect correlation is in the yoga tradition of India uh, called as karma. Karma refers to the system by which causes and effects are related. However, there is more subtlety, more sophistication in karma when it operates on conscious beings as when it operates on insentient things. Suppose I take this cell phone and I drop it. I won't drop it. <laughs> but suppose I drop it. Then the cell phone has no free will whether to fall or not. It is going to fall. Uh, Einstein is attributed to have said that Gravity can explain the falling of objects, but gravity can't explain people's falling in love. <laughs> it can't explain people's falling in love. Why not? Because people have their own free will. They are not just mechanical products who act according to mechanical laws. But still, even in our day to day, uh, be, uh, conduct interaction with each other. If somebody who is normally cool and composed, one day suddenly they are very irritable. I ask what happened? There's a particular way they are behaving. If there's some something which is un out of the order, we ask what what happened? Why are you behaving like this? So basically, the cause effect correlation is foundational to our understanding of the world. Unfortunately, there are many times when our normal understanding of cause-effect does not work. And this happens not only in our day-to-day -day life, this happens also in science. So for example, at the start of the 20th century, around 1896, Lord Kelvin, who was one of the most celebrated physicists at his time, said that the biggest problem for physicists 
of the next century is going to be unemployment why because we have we have mapped out the whole world everything is understood and for future generations of physicists there is nothing to do except to fill in some details and newton's laws of physics which which made the foundation of what was called as classical physics they explain things with remarkable consistency but still there is a some small clouds on the horizon black body radiation was one thing which was not explainable and as science went to the fringes then that led to two dramatic new direction in physics to explain the functioning of subatomic subatomic phenomena quantum physics came up to explain the uh, behavior of galactic objects of cosmic objects moving at speed near the speed of light the relativity physics came up so at this point these two objects which are very small and objects which are very large were not explainable by the laws of physics as explained through newton's laws so scientists did not give up their faith that the universe works according to laws they looked for some deeper theory so newton's theory worked at a normal you could say anthropic human level but at microscopic and macroscopic levels when this theory didn't work they came up they didn't give up oh it's all disorderly they looked deeper to say is there some other theory which will explain this and the same principle applies in our day to day life also normally causes produce effects and effects are caused by certain effects come from certain causes so if a student fails in an exam the parents ask what happened did you study so it's a normal effect so we work according to this cause effect connection as i'm assuming that but sometimes this cause effect connection is no longer seen as happens when we commonly say that bad things happen to good people how many of you have had this experience you worked very hard for something did your best and still didn't get the result how many of you have this experience yes you work extremely hard i remember i i went i had participated in a location competition and my when i was in my teens i worked very hard and i prepared and i spoke and then after that the judge he said you spoke we didn't consider you also for the prize so why not we didn't understand what you said <laughs> <laughs> so now i thought that they would be impressed by my my high vocabulary high concepts but they just couldn't comprehend what i was saying so this is over simplified example but the principle i am giving is we may work hard but get no result at the same time we can also look around or look broader and sometimes we do a little work and still we get a lot of result sometimes we may study something in a sub, in a subject and that's what comes in the exam and we just click so sometimes this cause effect correlation doesn't work that means there is cause but still the result doesn't come or sometimes the cause is not there but still the effect comes about to take a simpler example so normally when we eat food we get energy by that but sometimes we eat and we get no energy now why is that there might be some digestive system getting disrupted because of which the food does not get converted into energy so normally the eating as the cause the effect is we get energy but when that doesn't happen 
we don't think it's chaotic there must be something else going on so we go to a doctor is there something wrong with my body and we try to understand similarly in life when we see this cause effect connection doesn't seem to be working that we try to be good but still bad things happen to us and conversely sometimes people do bad things and still they seem to be getting good in their life so when this cause effect connection is no longer seen to work at that time we need a deeper theory just like scientists looked for a theory beyond classical physics and that's how they came to quantum physics and relativity physics similarly we need a deeper theory to explain why things happen the way they do and that deeper theory which can better explain the illusive cause of a connection is theory of reincarnation reincarnation the word means karna means flesh like we have in carnivorous animals re means to again reincarnation means to come again in flesh that means to get a new body so reincarnation refers to something existing within us which comes back again and which acquires a body so what if uh, the idea in there here is that there is this there is something indestructible within us and that is what goes from one body to another that is called in uh, the yoga tradition the atma or the soul so so the yoga tradition has explained that our existence is three dimensional is the body the mind and the soul and this is akin to a computer system in which we have the hardware the software and the user the hardware is like the body the software is like the use is the, the mind and the user is the soul so the actions that we do in this life the soul moves from one body to another body like a user moving from one computer to another computer the user moves from one computer to another computer at that time the user is the same so when some bad things happen to us then there seems to be no serious cause over there we are not done anything that simply means that we are getting some reaction from a previous life and if we are doing good and the result is coming that simply the result will come later and this distance between the action and the reaction between the cause and the effect this is determined by higher forces we can call them as destiny now we see even in our day to day experience that causes they produce effects but there may be a variable time duration between them if we have if we take a agrarian analogy if there are if somebody sows grains then normally how long does it take for grains to get harvested how long roughly season yeah it's a season a few months in 3 4 months but if somebody sows some fruit trees this how long will it take years be years the cause is there i sowed the seeds the effect is there got the harvest but depending on which seed is sown the harvest may take time similarly each action that we do is like a seed that is sown that seed will harvest but some may harvest immediately some may harvest after some time some may ha harvest after some lifetimes also this principle this if we consider that there is action reaction correlation 
but it extends before this body and beyond this body then that can better explain why the cause effect correlation that we normally see in life we sometimes can't see it normally there is cause effect correlation but sometimes it just is not there so why because some causes are from a previous life and some effects are going to come in a future life now this whole idea of reincarnation uh, okay it means it's an interesting theory but what, uh, what is the what is the basis for it should we just have to believe it let's do a simple thought experiment to understand this three level model of the self so wherever you are sitting you can sit in a relaxed way and close your eyes now after closing your eyes you can take three deep breaths with me one two three now with your eyes closed try to look at what you see in front of you because your eyes are closed you won't be able to see physically whatever is ahead of you but there is something like a inner screen inside you on which you may see various images you may see this room you may see your home you may see your car your friend you may see some food you may see a stream of various images appearing and disappearing on that inner screen or you may just see a static haze dull pattern of uh, colors on the inner screen now whatever you may see on the inner screen while looking at it see if you can take a step back and look at who is looking at this inner screen while you are looking at the inner screen try to take a step back and look at who is looking try once again take a step back and try to look at the seer of the inner screen no matter how many steps you take back the inner seer steps back with you what you are looking for is what you are looking with you are the inner seer you are the soul the inner screen is your mind you can take one deep breath and then you can open your eyes thank you so right now when you look at me your inner screen is acting like a window and what you are seeing outside is appearing on the inner screen and that's how you are able to see me but sometimes this inner screen starts acting like a tv and you may remember oh this person said this to me how dare they say like this i'm going to get back at them and immediately a revenge fantasy starts off so on that inner screen which becomes a tv a movie starts off over there and then that's when we get upset minded then somebody is talking over there earth to you earth to you where are you <laughs> then we come back so basically this three level uh, there whenever any perception happens when you see me or i see you at that time the inner seer the inner screen and the outer scene all three need to be in one line 
the inner sear the inner screen and the outer scene all three when they are in one line then perception happens when we are absent minded the inner screen shows us something else and then we can't see even if the visual data is coming in our eyes so <coughs> when we look for causes and effects at that time we are looking at the physical level of reality but the physical level is only one level of reality so the inner screen is like the software we consider a computer inner screen like out software the outer world is like the hardware and the physical reality the inner sear is the spiritual reality So when we say earlier I said we have one computer and then we go to another computer. As soon as we log on to the new computer, say with our Gmail ID, then our preferences, our previous search history, everything gets carried over with it, and this gets carried over. Then say. If we have searched something repeatedly, then that is what will come up automatically. So here, say in America, the movie industry is known as Hollywood. In India, it's known as Bollywood. It's a place called Mumbai. It's called Bollywood. So say if somebody has searched repeatedly for bollywood that a b bollywood once twice thrice four times then next time whenever they type b what will the computer do it will do a auto complete it will give bollywood over there now suppose somebody comes to a spiritual that person and they hear about the bhagavad gita and they go, what is the bhagavad gita i want to know about it and they go in google and as soon as they type b what will happen bollywood. bollywood will come why they wanted to type bhagavad gita but bollywood came because it was earlier so all of us have our tendencies now some of those tendencies may be acquired by the kind of friend circle we have but there are many tendencies that we are born with when i was talking on reincarnation concept of identical twins now because the twins are always identical aren't they yes they are we have two twins over here they are oh so shama takhi and shama gopi mata is they are there over here so shivani and shivangi so now they are twins if you look at them they look not just similar but identical hmm? that's the what twins are but still in biology identical twins has some more specific meaning identical twins refers to that when perception happens that time if one zygote is formed and that one zygote splits into two and then two twins are born then they are genetically not just similar they are genetically identical now if they are genetically identical then all the if we were simply physical creatures then all the characteristics of genetically identical twins should be identical because they have also grown up in the same family So at the same upbringing, they possibly go to the same school. But even genetically identical twins are not identical. They have similarities, but they also have dissimilarities. I was thinking on this topic in at that time, one man got up and he said, "Actually, you know, I have a genetically identical twin, and till now, nobody could explain to me why we are so different." He said, "I'm an introvert. He's an extrovert. He says, 'I love reading. He loves music. 
you know, I like horses, he likes cars. Uh, he says, externally we are as similar as we can, as identical as we can get. Internally we are extremely dissimilar. So where are these dissimilarities coming from? They are not coming from the body. Because the body is genetically identical. They are coming from the mind. The mind is like the inner screen, it is like the software. So, we all are souls who are on a multi-life journey of spiritual evolution. And in this multi-life journey of spiritual evolution, the present body that we have is like one lap, one stage. And by past karma, two souls may be born as twins. So that's how they get identical bodies. But still, each of them is a soul who has gone through their own journey before this life. And that is why even identical twins are not identical. They are physically identical but not behaviorally identical, not psychologically identical. Because there is something coming from a previous life which determines their interests, their inclinations their instincts, their impulses. Why are we the way we are? One reason is, it comes from our past life. Sometimes some people may say that, uh, some people have a mysterious interest in a particular field. Some people just grow up and the first time they see a musical instrument, they pick up and start playing it. And they just did they expert at playing it. And nobody taught them. Just got it. Well, now we may say they got it by genetics. But sometimes their parents may not be interested in music at all, their grandparents may not be interested in music at all. But still they got it somehow. So behaviorally is one way we can understand that there is something more to us beyond our body. And that shapes who we are. significant research in this field, Dr. Ian Stevenson uh, from the <coughs> Virginia Medical School and he did extensive research spending 40 years traveling across all the inhabited continents doing extensive research in cases of past life memories. So there are cases where, where is the it disappeared. One to dreamland. <laughs> Good. So um, sometimes some small children, they just one day they tell, Mommy, Mommy, where is my other mommy? What? Parents just don't understand. And sometimes the kid may say that I was big then, I'm small now. What do you mean? So so there are cases of spontaneous past life memories which children all over the world talked about. There are also cases of hypnotically induced past life memories. You can go to a past life regression expert and they can put you in hypnosis and take you back. But in this case, Stevenson deliberately chose not to study these cases because he was a scientist and he felt that in hypnosis people may be susceptible to such things. So in the hypnotist says, think backwards when you are five, when you are three, when you are one, when you are one month old, think what were you doing before that. Go Suddenly they may say, hey I am a 75 year old man and I am living in medieval Europe. Now, sometimes this may be true, sometimes it may not be true. We don't know. But with respect to spontaneous uh, past life memories, children without any stimulation from external sources just start speaking. And when he did the studies, he found four levels of patterns. First is recollections, second is recognitions, third is behaviors. And fourth is birthmarks and birth defects. 
so recollections means child we say that oh no, i lived there and i was doing this and i was doing that and then tell us over there so let me explain this through some examples so i have a book demystifying incarnation so in that i have mentioned several cases one i'll talk about this this case in turkey in adan a city in uh, case of this person called Nesip Undutaskiran. So when Nesip was around four years old, he would start telling his parents, I'm Nesip. They say, yeah, I'm Nes you're Nesip. No, I'm Nesip. Yeah, you're Nesip. But he said, I said, Nesip, and I live in another city. He says, what? No, you're living here. And then the small boy started saying, Chuki, I, uh, I stay over there. I have got a wife and I have got children. Small, five year old, six year old boy. And then he will say that I am staying in Mursi. Now his it was a few hundred kilometers away, and his parents neglect him. Then if you don't take me there, I will go there myself. Till the parents will pay much attention. Then he went to his grandfather who stayed in a village near Mersin and his grandfather had recently remarried so his mother went to meet his grand meet her father and his grandfather's new wife happened to be from Mersin and as soon as he saw her he recognized her and called her by the way you are this person said, how do you know and he started discussing a lot about Mersin and his grandfather got intrigued and took her there Took him there, and when he went there, just he had never been to Marsin before, but he led the vehicle all the way to the house. And at that place, there was a widow who there was a woman who was staying, and she was the widow of a man named Nisip. And he told her about their church children. He told her many many details. And not only did he do that, now this woman, Nesip's wife, wife from a previous life, after his death she had remarried. So when Nesip saw his wife's photo with another man, he got so angry, he picked up the photo and wanted to tear it apart. He said, you are my wife, not the else's wife. And not only that, he had Nesip, uh, Buddha. He had children from his previous life. Uh, he had his children. Now uh, these children were older than this boy. He started fondling their hair and treating them as if they were his children, although they were taller than him. And then he told that this Nasib had been a short tempered person. So, and in anger, he tried to attack her. So she dodged the blow, but the knife had uh, stabbed her on the thigh, in her th in her right thigh. So she got a scar on her in her right thigh. So then Dr. Stevenson asked one of his female assistants to take this woman to her private room, and then he examined her and found that she had a scar exactly where Nesip had described. And she told that this was a scar which my ex-husband. When he had attacked me, it happened at that time. So now, Turkey was and is a conservative country in many ways. A boy who has never met a woman, how can he know what is a mark uh, on a private part of her body? And not only that, Nessie had been born with seven birthmarks. Uh, and and whenever he would talk about his past life, he would say that he would point to his point to mark and he said, I was stabbed here. Now what happened as Nesip was a short tempered person and one time he got drunk and he had got to quarrel with another person who was also drunk. And while they were fighting, this other person he stabbed Nesip. So he was stabbed at seven different places. That's how he had died. So now, those seven points 
where Nasib had been fatally wounded, they that location precisely correlated with the location of the birth on Nasib's body in this life. So now in order to find out, so Stevenson wrote many books. The last book he wrote was a huge tome, several thousand pages, where he called it where reincarnation and biology intersect. So he basically focused on the correlation between the fatal wounds from a previous life and the birthmarks or birth defects in this life. So how precise is the correlation? He divided the human body into a uh, into twenty coordinate, one x y coordinates, and then this is at this point, and where is it on the body in this year? And now, for even one birthmark to correlate, the probability will be one by one twenty. And if seven birthmarks are correlating, that means the probability is one by one twenty raised to the power of seven. So it's an astronomically low probability. Significantly, birth marks and birth dates occur. Currently, science has two main explanations for them. One is that they are genetically caused. Now some some families genetically itself they may have some mark on their cheek or something on the neck or something like that, and they happen during pregnancy. If the mother is malnourished, or the mother takes some alcohol or smokes, or takes some substances which cause a scar on the skin of the embryo, then birthmarks can happen. But in nearly 50% cases, neither of these factors are there. Neither birthmarks, neither uh, genetic issues, nor any issue during pregnancy, and still. Birth defects come up. So why do they come up? It has no adequate explanation purely at the biological level. There was a Washington Post editor, Tom Schroeder. He was a skeptic, and he decided when he heard about Stevenson cases, cases he decided to travel with Stevenson and actually observe firsthand how he investigates. And then he wrote a book called Old Souls, and he found that when he went to London, India, with um, Stevenson and investig and observed Stevenson's investigative methods, <coughs> Stevenson would never prompt anyone. And Stevenson made policy that, and subsequent past life researchers follow that policy. They would never pay anyone for giving any testimony, because if they pay. And that will become a incentive for the patient for the subject to sensationalize their claims. Uh, there are almost three dozen girls who claim to be reincarnations of Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> now, here there is an obvious transparent motive to get fame by claiming to be a reincarnation of somebody famous. So Stevenson, as a matter of policy, refused to investigate. Any claims of reincarn uh, reincarnation involves involving, involving celebrities. So he was skeptical. His approach was of skepticism, and there are cases where there were remarkable recollections, remarkable recognitions, remarkable behaviors, remarkable birthmarks. Like I talked in the case of Nesip, he remembered precisely. I lived in this place. He recognized the uh, the wife and children from the previous life. He behaved jealously towards his wife, affectionately towards his children, and there were birthmarks. And there are scores of cases like these, which have no alternative explanation. If, if we if we want scientific indicators, that is also available. Now, what does it all imply for us? That if reincarnation is for real. If karma extends beyond this life, both before and after, then how does it? Ex what does? How does it matter for all of us? It matters in three primary ways. First is it explains why sometimes things don't produce the predictable results. If I do A, why don't I get B as a result? 
So if you consider this, that there might be something more going on, then we are basically left with chaotic universe. I do something and anything may happen in return. And how do I move forward in life? So one of the biggest causes of problems in today's world is mental health problems. And while mental health problems can have many specific causes, what happens when we have mental health problem? I talked earlier about the inner screen, the mind. So the two major mental health problems that people face today is depression and anxiety. When depression occurs, basically the inner screen that is there, it becomes like a TV that starts replaying all the bad things that have happened to us. Oh, this person did like this. Oh, this happened there. That happened there. That happened there. And as we start re watching this replay of all the bad things that have happened to us, we start getting more and more disheartened. And we start thinking, so many bad things have happened to me. This is going to happen to me in future also. And then we just lose energy to do anything. And conversely, when there is anxiety, what happens? The inner screen starts becoming again like a TV screen, but there it starts showing horror movies. Oh, this that go wrong. And in this horror movie, we are not the spectators. We are the victims. Just get paranoid. I go to office and I see a strange look in my boss's eyes. So why is my boss looking like this? Maybe my boss is going to fire me. Oh no, if I get fired, what will happen to me? How will I pay the mortgage for my house? If I can't pay the mortgage then, I'll be evicted. If I'm evic evicted, I'll have to look for some other house. If I don't get a house, then I'll be on the streets. Oh no, it's so cold. Now will I be on the streets? Now I will be feeling cold right now because of the AC. But I'm imagining I'll be on the streets and I'll be cold. So what has happened? The mind is in the future. Worry is like interest that we pay on loans we haven't yet taken. <laughs> it's like the interest we pay on loans we haven't yet taken. So, when we understand this bigger picture that sometimes what we may have done may not be the cause of the result, something bigger may be going on, then we don't catastrophize problems. One thing has gone wrong, now yes, you can say, oh, this went wrong in my life, that went wrong in my life, that went wrong in my life, yes, many things have gone wrong in our life. but. Surely, many things have gone right in our life also. If many things had not gone right, we would not even be alive right now. How many people? Most of us are in the age range of, age range of say, 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever. But how many people die before they even come to this age? The fact that we are still alive means something has gone right in our life. That's why we are still living. So, when this mind starts showing us the horror movie, why does it show the horror movie? Because we can't see the bigger picture. One thing goes wrong and we tend to catastrophize it. But if we understand the worldview of karma and reincarnation, then we won't catastrophize the problem. We will contextualize it. Contextualize it means that yes, I did this, this happened. I did not really do much wrong, but some of this big problem came up. Then there must be some some past karmic imbalance that needs to be corrected. Just let me let me tolerate it. Let me live through it. Toler tolerance can actually be a great strength. Tolerance means keeping small things small. So that we can focus on things. Sometimes, I 
should buy it as I told this in the class then one American friend he, he had exactly similar experience so basically if you go for camping somewhere and suddenly we feel a stick biting sensation on our leg look down and see the cheese bite us then grip is so strong that if we try to pull the knee they will pull out the whole but if we just let the leech do its work <laughs> what do you mean what do you do its work no it's, it's, it's sucking my blood yes it is sucking our blood but the leech does not have the capacity to suck blood unlimitedly it has its tubules and once its tubules are filled it will itself let go and you just flick it it will fall off and you can see it feel its tubules going inside our body and sucking the blood out but trying to pull it out will make things much worse so simply for us sometimes our past karma comes upon us like a leech biting us and when that leech is biting us if we to get we try to somehow in a major reaction we try to get rid of that problem that's like trying to that's like trying to pull the leech simply makes things worse but if we just tolerate tolerate then what happens that problem will one big advantage of a spiritual world view is that we understand that we are bigger than our problems we are bigger than our problems because no matter how big a problem is the problem is temporary whereas we are long lasting living beings so that gives us the capacity to tolerate it. and not just tolerance, but tolerance can be done much better in a spiritual level of consciousness so practices like yoga meditation study of sacred books study of wisdom spiritual wisdom texts all of them help us to rise to there experience relief we can experience security we can experience truth what rise to a spiritual level of reality imagine if there is a two story building and if we normally live at the ground level but there's a whole first level that we don't know about at all and one of my friends had a similar experience so i'll, I'll just tell two stories and then uh for so this last year when i come to america i was in florida at that time the hurricane irma hit florida so i knew it was coming so i left and i came to new york i gave some talks over there one of my friends was staying in florida on a retreat he cut himself off from the world completely just focusing on writing but one morning he just came his window and looked out and he saw like stormy clouds in the sky and he saw everything was inundated with water and like a concern he went and uh, turned on his internet he had to shut it off also turned on to check what was happening and there was no internet he tried to call someone this the phone was not working and he again went to the window and he saw the water level was rising rising no so he became panicky and then as he was looking at the power went off he was plunged in darkness he could, he could he had his, it was data but it was very cloudy inside it was very dark looking around what to do becoming more and more panicky he turned on his mobile flashlight was looking around and suddenly he saw that behind a closet there seemed to be something like a door so he pulled the closet and he saw there's a door he opened it and there's a narrow staircase that took up to an attic and he went there and he stayed in the attic 
Till then he had not even noticed there was an attic in that room, in that house. So the water level rose, rose. It covered the, it it inundated, flooded the first level. But at the second level he was safe. And then it stayed for almost 24 hours. Then it started receding. And then the power came back, the internet came back, and he was rescued. So suddenly, consider that our existence is two level, physical and spiritual. Physical is the ground level of existence, spiritual is the first level of existence. So normally, we live at the physical level only. But when some problems come, and we find that I just can't deal with this problem. Like a flood is rising, what can you do? When nothing seems to be working, if at that time we are fortunate, then we discover a staircase. We discover that there is another level to the house in which we are staying. So at that time, when at a physical level problems come up, if we are fortunate, we discover that our existence has an entirely different dimension. There is a spiritual side to us. And that spiritual side is where we can experience security. The stairs which take us to the spiritual side is it can be yoga, it can be meditation. We come from the Bhakti Yoga tradition where we chant mantras. So we are finite consciousness and finite consciousness. The chanting of mantras is a way that raises us from the material level to the spiritual level. It's not just like a staircase, it's like an elevator which takes us up. So the more we experience reality, the more we realize and relish security within ourselves. We realize and relish satisfaction. And we become convinced through our own experience that, that there is that I am bigger than my body. There is more to me than what biology has determined. That my destiny is bigger than my physical reality. And that can give us a security that can take us beyond whatever challenges that may send our way. We have to find out why this is happening like this. So one level I said is tolerance. Just tolerate it, it's temporary, it will go away. Like the leech bite. But now what I'm talking about is transcendence. Transcendence means rise above the problem. You can rise above the problem by practicing spirituality. By understanding <coughs> spiritual knowledge and practicing that spiritual knowledge through an appropriate spiritual process. So we chant a particular mantra called the Hare Krishna mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. As we repeat the mantra, we end, our consciousness enters into the mantra. And the mantra is like an elevator. As we step into it, it raises us up. And as we keep repeating the mantra, we feel our consciousness rising upwards. Be our past karma, whatever be the kind of things that happen to us, through tolerance and through transcendence, we can overcome whatever negativity comes in our life and we can relish spiritual evolution. Is what we are all going through culminates our being transported permanently to the spiritual level of reality where life and love reside eternally, where we can experience everlasting peace and everlasting joy. That is life's ultimate purpose and that is life's supreme perfection. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on demystifying nation. Started by talking about in science, as well as in day-to-day -day life, we presume the existence of cause-effect correlation. S science cannot progress unless we assume that there are some laws in nature. Laws essentially mean cause-effect correlation. 
and I said Newton's laws did not work then scientists started looking for some deeper explanation they did not give up their faith that there is a cause effect correlation but looked for deeper and that's how they came up with quantum physics and related. in our day to day life also we see a cause effect correlation I eat food I get strength but when this normal cause effect correlation doesn't work then we don't think things are chaotic there must be something else going on. We go to a doctor, this digestive system upset, is something else wrong. So similarly, in when the normal cause effect correlation doesn't seem to work in our life. We do good, but we don't get good results. We do uh, we get bad bad results. So why is that happening? That means there's some deeper theory that is required. And that deeper theory is that the cause effect correlation exists, extends before this life and beyond this life. We are souls on a multi-life journey of spiritual evolution. And to understand this, we did the thoughts experiment, talking about how we can see the inner screen, but not the inner seer. So the inner screen is the mind, the outer scene is the physical level of reality, the inner seer is the soul. It's like the hardware, software and user. It's the body, mind and soul. So we all get some tendencies which are from birth. It's like I go onto a new computer, but what, as soon as I log into it, whatever search trends and uh, preferences I have got from my previous computer, they will come on this computer also. So that, that, like that, we all have some congenital tendencies and we are only by, by genetics alone. Talk about genetically identical twins are still not identical behaviorally or psychologically. That's because they are two distinct souls who are sharing, who shared as I goat, but they are distinct in their own right. And another way I talked about a scientific point of a reincarnation was through the past life memories, spontaneous past life memories among children. Look at four pointers. Does anyone remember those four evidences? What were recollections? They remember the past. Then recognition. Yes, thank you. Then Behavior. behaviors and and birth and birth effect. Thank you. So, what is, how does it matter for how does it matter that bad things happen to us? Our mind tends to think that oh this bad thing has happened, everything bad is going to happen to me in my life. And we tend to catastrophize the problem. So the two major mental health problems are depression and anxiety and basically the mind which is the inner screen when it, it starts going to the past and playing all the bad things of the past that's what causes depression go in the future and starts uh, painting all horrendous scenarios of the future that causes anxiety but if you understand this one bad thing has happened yes it's just some karmic imbalance being evened out let me just tolerate it like a leech which is biting, there is no need for me to overreact. It will bite, some suck the blood, it will go away. Similarly, some bad things may happen. We all go through bad phases in life. These phases, they will stay for some time, they will go away. So tolerance is one strength that we can develop. We keep small things small and focus on big things. And the second is transcendence. Like this friend of mine who went trapped in a flood, who found and went to the second level in the building. Similarly, we, when problems come in our life, rise from physical level to the spiritual level by appropriate spiritual practices. Then we can experience security and security within ourselves. The purpose of spiritual evolution is to the spiritual level of reality and experience life and love eternal therein. Thank you very much. So are there any questions or comments? Yes, please. What's the difference, the difference between recollections and recognition? Okay, what is the difference between <coughs> recollections and recognition? Recollections are what the child does in their own family. I was, I was this person here, I was that person there, that, that person there. But recognitions means that the child is taken to the place 
where the claim previous life's memory is there and when the child is taken over there the child recognizes places people objects and many of these meetings have been planned where the past life researcher comes and does it in a strictly monitored environment they arrange everything is recorded either on uh, tape or on video so that basic recognition means the child is not just remembering but actually recognizes people at that particular place okay so is the mechanism of uh, carrying this information over to the next life through the causal body attached to the atma yes so how is this information carried over yes we could say the causal body the karana sharir as it is called that is an karana sharir sharir is the body causal is in sanskrit called as karana so karana sharir it's called as uh, it's called the causal body or it can also be called as the uh, subtle body so in the mind so the the soul goes from one body to another with the mind and the impressions are carried in the mind now for most people the impressions stay uh, at the back of their consciousness that's why most of us may not remember our past lives each new life is a new opportunity for the soul to move forwards that's why if it's a fresh beginning and if we started remembering the past lives we had gone through it would be like there would be a perpetual replay going on in our mind it would be a, it would cause a cognitive overload and we would not be able to function so normally most of us are not able to remember our past lives and that's just necessary because we cannot process infinite amount of information right now also how much do we remember from what happened to us 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago but those impressions are there and sometimes in some people they pop up so why do they pop up again this is karma it's like in our day to day life we observe that some people have outstanding memories they may have read one passage in one book 10 years ago and they can quote that passage some people have outstanding memories some people have outstandingly poor memories you know just read something one minute ago what did i read i just can't remember so why this variability this is by karma so similarly by some peculiar karma unusual karma some people can recollect their past lives but the impressions are stored in all of us and those impressions even if they do not come up for us as conscious recollections they come up as subconscious tendencies like i said why some people children musical some children mathematical right from birth they have that inclination that comes from there so remembering the past life that it, it stays in the mind itself but the mind is like a we could say an ocean of information like i have my computer on my computer i may have hundreds of gb of data but only a small amount of data will appear on my computer screen will one page from one document so like that the mind the karana shari the causal body it contains we could say huge amount of impressions over there but only a few of them pop up in our mind but what is in the background also shapes whatever apps are there in my computer whatever software it shapes the way the computer functions similarly all the subconscious impressions that are there which we have accumulated for many lifetimes they shape the baby function in this life okay. thank you any other questions or comments yes yeah so we may hear about people's reincarnation and still it's so easy to forget and live as if live at that level itself yeah this is something very interesting that i did most of these books that i studied they talk about significant and sometimes sensational cases of past life memories but i did some research further to find out did these kids who remember their past life grow up to become spiritual very few of them did in fact one of the most uh, interesting found 
was of a person named William Barnes. Uh, William Barnes claimed to be the reincarnation of the of one of the key designers of the Titanic, whose name was Thomas Andrews. And when the Titanic sank, uh, Black, who had been the main financer and organizer, he blamed Andrews. He did not design the ship properly, and that's why it sank. Now William Barnes gave a detailed account of how the ship sank and he gave the most one of the most satisfactory explanations of why the titanic sank so fast the ship's hull was made largely of metal and that's why it was touted as a ship that even god can't see now now uh, william barnes said that as thomas andrews one day he had been examining the ship before it went off on its voyage maiden voyage to hit the hull and a loud noise started resonating all over the ship and he got alarmed he said that we need to thicken the hull the impact on the hull is causing resonance and if this resonance becomes too forceful it will cause multiple breakages in the ship but then black said that oh, already this voyage is planned we can't delay it we can't do any more work on it just let's go so that eventually when the it collided with the iceberg what happened was that the titanic cracked at multiple places it was not just one hole and that's why it sank before any for adequate amount of help could before help could come to it so anyway the point is that William Barnes is convinced and many people who have heard his testimony are also convinced that he was Thomas Andrews. He has given a good amount of objective evidence. But William Barnes, he has no spiritual interest. He said, the mission of my life is to clear the good name of Thomas Andrews that was spoiled by Black. So what has happened over here? That one's spiritual consciousness determines not on one's recollections but on one's intentions i may re recollect the previous life but that may not make me spiritual that may still make me simply correct some wrongs from a previous life what we need for spiritual growth is our intention and how does it come it comes primarily associated with spiritually minded people, our spiritual inclinations, our spiritual interests develop. Now, our desires are not just linear, they are also triangular. Linear means, say, we can go to a hotel and we see a delicious looking burger over there. Say, I want to eat it. So, I see the object and I get when first time I had gone to Australia mm, several years ago so the my host there told me that we want to give you a baklava mm -hmm. at that time I had never heard of baklava mm -hmm. so I said maybe later <laughs> uh, then I was taking uh, food with uh, another friend his friend said this and then he was baklava and he was eating it and he was ecstasy Give me one also. <laughs> <laughs> so, just hearing or seeing about the baklava did not give me the desire. But when I saw somebody else eating it, then I got the desire. So, the desire is not just linear, it is also triangular. So, similarly, you know, our spiritual inclination may be a picture of somebody doing yoga or somebody doing meditation. That may or may not trigger our interest may hear about some spiritual book of wisdom that may or may not trigger our interest about reading it but if we come and associate with spiritually minded people oh this person they are also nice people they are also like me but they are so spiritually inclined what is the spiritual business I want to know about it so our spiritual is internally on our intention and externally on our association so even if we don't have any recollections, if we just try to have spiritual association, we will grow spiritually.
Yes, please. Uh, speaking on reincarnation, would you, would you say that, that our past desires and karmas determine our, our gender, race, as well as our nationality in the next do our past karma determine our gender, race, nationality? Yes, definitely. Uh, the body that we acquire is like a dress for the soul. It depends on the soul. So if I am staying as a tenant in a particular house and my tenancy period expires, I'm going to now, which house I get? Two things. One is my interests, my interests, and second is my budget. So similarly, from when the soul transits from one life to another life, it's like the soul is going from one bodily residence to a new bodily residence. So, which bodily residence will it get? That's determined by the soul's desires. What does the soul want? And secondly, by its karma. What does it deserve? How much can it afford? So when we do, if we consider our, like we have bank balance, where we, if we invest, it grows. Where we spend, it decreases. So like that, we have a karmic balance, which we take from one life to another. So when we do good actions, that karmic balance grows up. When we do bad actions, the karmic balance goes down. And there is this balance of karma that we have of good actions and bad actions which are accumulated together that determines what kind of body you will get and body, which gender's body it will be which race, which nationality which diversity or karma ok yes please Oh, okay. Does reincarnation happen infinitely or is it a uh, finite number? So, infinite. But on, it depends on us. Uh, it is our desires that power the wheel of reincarnation. Sometimes you may have seen this image of chuck a big giant wheel in which the wheel is moving down, round and round. So like that, we go through various species in the cycle of reincarnation, various bodies. What powers this is our desire. So the, the kind of desires we have, the kind of experiences we want to enjoy, they determine where we go and what we do in this life. And they determine where we go and what we do in the next life also. So as long as we love the temporary things of this world. Till then, we will take both again to enjoy temporary things. But we learn to love the eternal. And if our love for the eternal becomes greater than the love for the temporary, then we go out of the cycle and we attain the eternal. Now, what exactly is the eternal? That is, uh, that is revealed to different degrees in different traditions. Uh, the Bhagavad tradition describes that eternal is uh, all attractive supreme being. He has infinite presence and infinite light which pervades and permeates all of the world. But along with that light, that absolute is also a person. And that person is all loving and all lovable. So the process of bhakti yoga is the process, it's the yoga of love. So we could, we in the yoga of love, we train ourselves to direct our love towards the eternal. And as we keep practicing bhakti, uh, the, uh, then our love for the eternal starts increasing more and more. And if in this life itself we can practice bhakti and make our love for the eternal greater than the love for the temporary things of this world, then this life itself can be 
the end of our reincarnation cycle and we can go beyond reincarnation to eternal life it's like somebody may have somebody the tenant in one house their tenant period expires they go to another house they go to another house but if somebody saves enough to buy their own house then they stay there and they don't have to come out so like that if we grow spiritually in terms of developing our love for the spiritual for the eternal then we acquire enough credits by which we rise to the spiritual level of reality and that's how the cycle of reincarnation ends thank you yes good if we take a path of transcendence does it reduce our karmic reactions or does it give us strength to face our karmic reactions both yes. actually our past karma comes to us at four levels one is the very body that we have got some of us may have a sickly body some of us may have a healthy body some of us may have may be born in a wealthy family some of us may be born in not such a wealthy family So it's like all of us have got a particular car, and this car is not going to change. This body is the body that I'll have throughout my life. I can change it a little bit uh, through exercise, through uh, fitness, or what, through health, whatever. But in a major way, I can't change it. So that is one installment of karma that is going to be unchanging no matter what happens. But what i do with the body i got a vehicle it i can use that vehicle and drive recklessly and cause a wreck and hurt myself or land myself in jail or i can drive it responsibly and get to a get to home or safe safe destination so what we do with our body is up to us now uh, means what do we what we do in our life depends on two things one is our knowledge and second is our determination So when we have no knowledge of life's spiritual dimension, then we'll just live materialistically. So spiritual growth, our spiritual journey, gets begins with acquiring spiritual knowledge. And then sometimes, even if we know something is the right thing to do, but still we get impelled by our desires to do act wrongly. So spiritual growth changes that. So why are we impelled to act wrongly? Like I said, this. Bollywood popping up. Even if I type Bhagavad Gita, that's the that's the impressions from the past. So when we start going further and further, we start getting impressions from the past. So when we start going further and further, we start getting impressions from the past. So when we start going further and further, we start getting impressions from the past. So when we start going further and further, we start getting impressions from the past. So when we start going further and further, we start getting impressions from the past. So when we start going further and further, we start getting impressions from the past. So when we start going further and further, we start getting impressions from the past. So when we start going further and further, we start getting impressions from the past. So when we start going further and further, we start getting impressions from the past. So when we start going further and further, we start getting impressions from the past. So when we start going further and further, we start getting impressions from the past. So when we start going further and further, we start getting impressions from the past. So when we start going further and further, we start getting impressions from the past. So when we start going further and further, we start getting impressions from the past. So when we start going further and further, we start getting impressions from the past. So when we start going further and further, we start getting impressions then at an external level so certain bad things will happen to us but those bad things can themselves be minimized that means see the purpose of karma is not retribution the purpose of karma is reformation it is the point is not that you did this so you have to get this the point is for our is for us to So suppose somebody has done some crime and they are put in jail, they may get a sentence of ten years. But if they behave very well in the jail, the sentence may be reduced to just five years. Sometimes, if they behave very well, then the sentence may be cleared also completely. So like that, one of the great modern series of the Bhakti tradition, Shri Prabhu Pad, he would explain that suppose we might. By our past karma, meant to go through an accident where our neck might be cut, but we might end up with we are cutting some vegetable and our finger gets cut. So that cutting happens, but it's a relatively minor cut. So the karmic karmic reaction that is going to come, that will come, but it will get significantly minimized. And lastly, even the reaction that comes. 
if our capacity to tolerate increases then we can end it over there yes okay this reaction comes if in panic in anger i i i want to move i have a knee jerk reaction to it i aggravate the situation so our inner capacity to tolerate also and that's how through knowledge through inner transformation through minimization of the reaction and through increased tolerance tolerance to the reaction uh, we create uh, spiritual knowledge helps us spiritual practices as themselves to so create a right fuel for ourselves thank you the last question yes please So how is reincarnation? Our mind and its tendencies are what we have acquired from our previous lives. So some of us may be short-tempered, some of us may be pessimistic, some of us may be optimistic, some of us may be even-tempered. Now this can be a result of our upbringing. It can be a result of our association. but some of it is also a result of our past life karma that is the kind of impressions that are there on our mind now the impressions we could say they create certain inclinations so this floor if this floor were inclined in a particular way if it is inclined this way if water falls on the floor then naturally the water will move in that direction now if i have got some electronic items there i don't want water to go there but still if the water falls it will move in that direction so similarly we all have certain inclinations we could say our mental floor is inclined based on the impressions there and as soon as we have some idle time and we're not doing something immediately our thoughts start flowing in that direction so if i happen to be a warrior then normally now research so psychologists have found when do you worry the most you know do all of us have a daily worry time you know evening 7 to 7:30 i'm going to worry <laughs> <laughs> it's not like we don't have a worry time at one level we could say worry is like a background noise that is always there but it doesn't trouble us so much it is when we have nothing to do Maybe our whole day is over. Now we are relaxed. We are in, want to be be in leisure, or we are doing some activity that does not require engagement of our mind. We do some physical activity which uh, which our mind is mind is idle. So when 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 we have free time, our mind works overtime. <laughs> it works overtime. It says, "Hey, this problem, that problem. This person did like this. They did like that." So basically, uh, the uh, flickering nature of the mind is because of the past impressions within it. And where it will flicker, in what direction, that is determined by the particular kind of impressions that might be there. So for some people, worry. Some people, it might be resentment. some people to be revenge But now this is determined by our past karma but the key thing is we have to understand that that our existence is three level that i am not my body and i am not even my mind i am different from it once we understand this that knowledge itself empowers us if i imagine let's say i talk about an inner screen now this inner screen you could imagine that there are many windows open on it so i'm working on writing some article and suddenly some pop up comes up a software update available do you want to update now yes no remind me later i will look at it i'll say okay i'm doing some important remind me later but sometimes if some pop pop ups come up which are such that i just by default are on yes 
and if they book 30 seconds or within 30 seconds we don't click it on no it will just go on or if we some sometimes visit some mm, some pirating web website or something like that then a pop up comes up and you can't see any cross anywhere you know where do i cross it just there just is there on the screen so basically on our inner screen what pops up is determined by our past karma past karma means it can be previous life or in this life but we can choose whether to focus on it or it means if i am doing a particular work and suddenly something pops up i can minimize it but i can just drag it as spiritual understanding helps us to become an observer of our emotions observe our thoughts and then we observe then we can process them okay do i need to act on this right now or i don't need to act so the bhagavad gita says that become a detached observer so in english there are two words there is <coughs> uninterested and there is disinterested uninterested means one who has no interest in the subject only but disinterested means one who has vested interests but neutral impartial so we need to become a disinterested observer of our inner screen so to say there is a uh, some sports like cricket or baseball mm? and cricket so the the players appeal it how's that is the player out is the batsman out now the player in the umpire has to evaluate the appeal the umpire needs to be disinterested not uninterested <laughs> <laughs> if the players appeal how's that and the umpire says how's that in the match <laughs> what <laughs> what are you doing over there you have to watch the match bye just because the players are appealing that does not mean the umpire has to say they out the umpire has to process is this appeal valid not valid no not out there so similarly when we gain spiritual knowledge and not just theoretically but if we do spiritual practices that helps us understand that we are different from our mind and then when certain things pop up in the mind then we can evaluate them we become like an umpire okay i'm feeling angry so anger is popped up or negativity has popped up so do i need to act on it or no we can evaluate that now for some things it will be easy to do it for some still very difficult like some pop up the worst option is within 5 seconds you have to click no otherwise it just goes off and starts installing whatever is there so basically for all of us is stimulus and response so these two things are there say right now you are sitting and suddenly the temperature goes down so when the stimulus is the temperature goes down then maybe we are rather cloth that's the response so now the stronger an impression that means the stronger the habit or the conditioning that means a lesser is the distance between the stimulus and the response when some somebody say has never drunk alcohol and then they pass by a bar they say no problem in drinking the stimulus is there but there is no response no no interest somebody is is a habitual alcoholic and they pass by the bar as soon as they pass by the bar they don't pass by the bar they pass into why this response stuck together mm. i think mark twain said that giving up smoking is the easiest thing in the world i have done it over 100 times <laughs> so what happens when you are habituated to something the stimulus and the response get tied together and it's it's almost instinctive it's it's with instantaneous rather the stimulus comes and the response happens but as we become more and more spiritual we can create a greater and greater distance between the stimulus and the response so like i see a strange look in my boss eyes and immediately 
my mind starts showing me a horror movie i get worried i get panicky but then as i become more spiritual i understand that this inner screen is different from me okay this what has happened okay what exactly is the problem what exactly is the problem i use a acronym called fear f e a r to deal with the unwanted stimuli that come on the in the mind you know f is focus focus means when the fear comes in we start getting worry what exactly is the problem focus oh you know my boss look at my boss what exactly is the problem okay the problem is my boss may fire me okay what exactly is the problem okay the problem is that you now i got this job i want to do this assignment if i don't do it my boss will fire me okay the problem is i need to do this assignment well so focus focus if you just ask what exactly is the problem after again and again you can get the inner screen to focus then e is engage engage means what can i do about it right now and this may go wrong that may go wrong. what can i do about it right now okay you know i got to this do this assignment let me do it well then engage as soon as we do these two things focus and engage that brings the inner screen back to the present we are looking at the situation as it is and we are doing something about it a large amount of the negativity within the mind uh, will go down just by these two things focus and engage but third a is arise arise means with spiritual knowledge i raise my consciousness upwards like i told the story of this my friend who went to a higher level so arise so we try to remind ourselves of our spirituality we try to practice some deep breathing practice some yoga chant some mantras by which we raise our consciousness upwards and that gives us security that gives us strength and an r is release release means that in our life some things are in our control and some things are not in our control and there is actually a great power in letting go of the things that are not in our control we may think that releasing is actually a sign of weakness oh no but when things are not in our control when we let go of those things then we can catch hold of our thoughts and focus them on what is in our control and this releasing becomes easier when we understand that there is a higher plan and a higher purpose to life like i talked earlier about we being finite consciousness and there is a infinite consciousness beyond so that infinite consciousness has a plan for all of us normally in our consciousness two options the things are in my control or things are out of my control but when we have spiritual consciousness then we understand that things that are out of my control are not out of control there is and what that plan is how to work out that i may not know right now but release if i just let go then that helps us to calm down to focus i will just tell one story about this i was planning to tell it in the in the class i said i'll tell two stories this was i had when i came to america last year i as at an airport i was at denver and as i was coming actually i was going from denver to another city at that time there was a loud alarm and then before i understood what was happening there were six security police people were pointing their guns at me so what happened they said that my crutches when they were going through the security system they signaled a high explosive in it so they said you know we will have to frisk you in a special chamber and we have to frisk all your luggage so i said okay i said the crutches don't have anything in it it says no uh then they started looking so they said one of them said that we they said we will have to break the crutches cuz we have to see what is inside they said if you break the crutches how will i walk <laughs> maybe one of them had a 
quarrel at home or something. He said, that's not my problem. <coughs> so, I just became, initially I was just annoyed, but I started getting alarmed. And then, uh, I study the Bhagavad Gita regularly, I read the Bhagavad Gita regularly. So, I like to recite the Gita's verses. So, somehow at that time, uh, as I was becoming panicky, suddenly the thought came in my mind that, there is a verse in the Gita which says, that, there is this Ishvara Sarva Bhutana Mhritti Shaya Arjuna Tishthi Brahmayan Sarva Bhutani Yantra Rudani Mayaya That we are all wandering but there is a Supreme who is guiding our wanderings and we are on a bodily machine which is directed ultimately by that Supreme So as that I started reciting that verse suddenly that thought came in me that I have travelled through so many countries, so many cities. In each of those journeys, so many things could have gone wrong. But I have survived through it all. If I go backwards, I am a soul. I have gone through so many lifetimes. So many things could have gone wrong. But still, things have worked out. So now also things will work out. So I just prayed and let thy will be done. I just let go. And as soon as I did this, I just started feeling calm. And, and at that time another security person came. He said, what's going on? He said, he said they explain, this person explained. He said, you know, I'll take care of this. And then he took my crutches and he said, actually, your crutches are openable. Can we open them? I said, sure. Anything is better than breaking the crutches. <laughs> and they opened the crutches. Then before coming to coming to America, I had gone into a sacred place called Rindavan for taking blessings before coming on this tour. So there, there is a sacred river which unfortunately has become very polluted. So when I was walking over uh, banks of that river, the, the tips, the rubber padding that was there at the below my crutches, that had come off. And the soil from the bank had got accumulated inside the pipe of the crutches. And because that was polluted, so that had high metal content in it. And that was of explosive. <laughs> <laughs> so, finally, so they opened it and they said, what is this? I said, what does it look like? I said, it's dirt. Yeah, obviously, what else can be there? I said, what is it doing over there? He just put it on the dirt. And he looked at it, he looked at it. I said, this, this is dirt only. They brought their device, put it in simple dirt. They said, you go home and clean your crutches. You can go now. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't even know that there was any dirt inside it. And it got accumulated. So the point is, at that particular time when I was just panicky, it's release. So let go. When we do that, so focus, engage, arise and release. If we do these four things, when many of our mental health issues, we can substantially decrease the agitation and increase our focus on Thank you very much for your attention and participation. I hope that this I said in the beginning that you already begun the yoga journey and you can expand your ambit of yoga and find more and more of spiritual experience and spiritual elevation in your lives. Thank you very much. Two of the best places you can focus on your practice.